Well, good morning, my friends. Coming to you live from Orange County, California, Brooks House. Today we're gonna do some more vlogging down here. I think you'll enjoy this one. We're gonna do a little cemetery visit. Days with Jordan the Lion begins now. Start the day out here looking at Brooks Pond and saying hi to this guy. So where we are planning on going today is actually over closer to Newport. Um, I think it's Corona Del Mar. And we're going to see one specific grave, but there are a few famous people there that uh, we might stop by and see as well. We'll just see how time goes and how fast we find the other grave. But the one I wanna see today is somebody who I've done a vlog on before. We've been to his boat <laughs> and this person didn't have a headstone for over 20 years. So I'll tell you about it when we get there. Let's go. And there's Flash, Brooks Turtle. And there's my Flash. And here we are, Pacific View Memorial Park. Well, as soon as you enter the cemetery, you get to view this Court of Valor all the flags and the memorials to all the branches of service. First grave we're gonna see today is the main grave that we came for. Well, located down here in Corona Del Mar is maybe the most famous cowboy of them all, John Wayne. Born and raised, well, not born here, but he was Brought here at the age of five and raised in Southern California and became maybe one of the biggest movie stars of all time. Over 150 movies. He got his start, well, I mean, first he went to USC. He was on the football team. His name was actually Marion Morrison, and he would eventually change that once he would get in the movie business. But he originally first wanted to go into the Naval Academy and then he changed his mind and wanted to become a lawyer and while he was studying he ended up being noticed by uh, Tom Mix got on to uh, being a stuntman on some cowboy pictures and then John Ford saw him and John Ford wanted to put him in a movie and so John Ford had to fight the studio but ended up getting John Wayne in Stagecoach which basically lifted his career and took him on to the road that he would be known for and that we would know him for. That man right there. The guy we would see riding the horse. Man against country. Man against the wilderness. Now John's story is kind of interesting because he just for some reason even though people thought he wasn't a great actor he just had a screen charisma. And, uh, and apparently on set he was a real card. He loved to uh, play practical jokes. He used to uh, prank the people that he worked with. James Caan told a story of how he was filming a scene and John would say, hey, you should say this. And the director would tell him to say something else and every time they go to film it, he'd do what John said. And then the director would come yell at him and he finally realized that John was just kind of screwing with him. But he had a legendary smoking habit, five packs a day, and that's what ended up eventually killing him. You can see here, it says tomorrow is the most important thing in life. Comes into us at midnight very clean. It's perfect when it arrives and it puts itself in our hands. It hopes we learned something from yesterday. Now this is a relatively new marker, maybe 20 years old. And for 20 years, he didn't have a marker. Some say online that it was because his family didn't want a marker, because they didn't want people to come and deface the grave. Some say it was actually John himself that didn't want a marker because he didn't want this to become some spiritual pilgrimage for people. He just looked at himself as a guy who was in movies. And, uh, you know, he was, I loved him in Rio Bravo, Rio Grande, El Dorado. Um, who shot Liberty Valance, uh, what else? 
Stagecoach is great too. Red River, uh, True Grit, he won an Oscar for True Grit. That's actually probably one of my favorites. Rooster Cogburn, that kind of stuff. Just absolutely hilarious. Um, what was the other one uh, that he made with Maureen O'Hara? That one was really good. Rooster, or uh, that was, um, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting it. I'll, I'll put the name right here. But John's also kind of a polarizing guy because he, uh, he was somebody who was a staunch Republican and they actually even named the airport here in this county after him. Now some people have argued that he didn't, wasn't a true patriot because he didn't serve and you know every time I do or mention anything John Wayne somebody says that and so I looked into it and what I found out was that the first time that he uh, was drafted or that he was supposed to go in he actually had four kids and so he had a deferment because he was the uh, the financial breadwinner of the family now I was also able to find an interview with John Ford's grandson where John Ford has some correspondence between the two where John's kind of given the Duke the business about not being in the military because John Ford had enlisted and was serving at that time and so John Wayne actually did fill out the application to join the OSS but what they said happened was um, the paper by that point John and his wife um, split up somewhere in the time that he had filled out the paperwork and um, and he was this was when stagecoach had come out he was starting to become a big star and so um, they said that when the paperwork was sent it was sent to his old address which was where his wife lived and they said that they believe his wife didn't give him the paperwork because she had four kids and if he died in war she'd have to take care of him solely and he was an up-and-coming star like i said he was already having success with a couple of movies and stagecoach was mainly the big one now the second time that he was uh eligible to go in it was actually um, from what i understood it was republic pictures that requested him to not be sent to war because um he was the biggest box office draw that they had and they had argued that without him the film company might go under and that the morale of the people would also be in jeopardy. And then the third time, some people argue that he should have been involved in, uh, you know, later efforts. He was too old. So, you know, argue what you will, he had a, uh, an affinity for the military. Um, in fact, buying a naval minesweeper for the last 20 years of his life, and when he moved out of uh, Beverly Hills, he pretty much was living off and on that boat. He had a house here in Newport Beach, but he, for the most part, would spend a lot of time traveling to Catalina, to Mexico, various places on that minesweeper. So here's where he eventually would pass away and be buried for people like us to come and visit his grave. I, uh, my introduction to John Wayne, I think, was growing up watching Mary with Children and Al Bundy always talking about that one time a year where TV would show Hondo and every year somebody would ruin it for him somehow. And that name, John Wayne, just always stuck out in my mind. And then when I finally saw a John Wayne picture, I think the first thing I saw was El Dorado and I was hooked, so. Like he said, some people thought he wasn't a great actor, but he said, I've been making movies for 50 years, 152 movies. I think I learned something along the way. If you already haven't seen the video, go look on my channel for John Wayne's Minesweeper, The Wild Goose, because it's now owned by Hornblower Cruises. They were nice enough to let me go out there and tour the boat, and it's quite an experience to get to see where John Wayne spent so much of his time in the later years. If you notice over his shoulder, it's the Alamo. Yeah, he played war heroes, cowboys, all kinds of things. And you know, he actually said in an interview with Barbara Walters, he said the biggest life lesson he had as an actor probably was, he said he was on set and he was telling some people on set how he wanted to make every kind of movie there was. He wanted to play every role there was. And Harry Carey's wife, uh, Harry Carey was in the movie as well and Harry Carey's wife pulled him aside and said you're an a-hole you know do you think that 
people want to see that people like you as a cowboy give them what they want don't disrespect the audience and he said he thought about it and he said you know what she's right and he said it was the best advice I ever got and that's also why he's probably remembered as the most famous cowboy of them all Now one of the interesting things about this cemetery is that they like to put wind chimes in all the trees. Here's our next person we wanted to visit, Mr. Bobby Hatfield. Bobby was an amazing talent through his beautiful voice and wonderful sense of humor. Our memories and your unchained melody will live on through eternity we love you and we miss you. If you believe in forever, then life is just one nightstand. That's right, if you haven't figured it out yet, Bobby Hatfield was one half of the Righteous Brothers, and he was the one that sang most of the tenor parts and sang Unchained Melody. Now, of course, you probably know them for Unchained Melody, you've lost that love and feeling, and, uh, they were one of those groups that really, they really took off once Phil Spector found them. Phil Spector was a big part of their career, but what beautiful voices they had. This is his final resting place. Now here is the section of land where we're looking for the next person that we want to visit, who is also in the field of music but much different style of music someone who uh, was one of the reasons that I ever found out what heavy metal was we're looking for the man who fronted Quiet Riot as we're looking for Kevin I just noticed this one that says Holocaust Survivor well right over here he is Kevin Mark Dubrow, one of the founding fathers of Quiet Riot and one of the bands that really kind of kicked off the heavy metal hair band craze of the 80s with Come On Feel The Noise, they covered Metal Health, and brought us Randy Rhodes. If you remember when they very first started out, even before Come On Feel The Noise, they had a young Randy Rhodes as their guitar player. Now this band, when Come On Feel The Noise came out, they just shot through the roof. They became the most famous band in the world, almost overnight. They were on the cover of all the Hit Parader and all the metal magazines. They were on MTV constantly. They were headlining shows, and unfortunately they had a, uh, Kevin at least, had a pretty bad cocaine problem, and it pretty much would plague him throughout his life. But during that time, he, was partying so much in the height of their fame that he just was, even to his admission, he was just a gigantic jerk to everyone. Whenever he was interviewed, he would put down all the bands that were out. He would put down the magazines that were reviewing them. He was basically playing a wrestling villain, almost. He was just criticizing and uh, talking about how great Quiet Riot was and Next thing you know, they couldn't follow it up, and some say the writers were just turned off. And they had a, um, I think it was 1987, they finally had enough of Kevin, they kicked him out of the band, and he went on to make some solo records and things, but nothing ever really that successful. Um, and then they brought him back in the band because uh, Rudy Sarzo and the, all the guys that you know they they all loved each other like brothers but you know they were trying to find a way to keep it together and there's actually a really really great documentary on uh, on Quiet Riot with Frankie Benali and Rudy Sarzo and some of the people that were in there kind of talking to them about Kevin because Kevin had already passed by the time they they made this he unfortunately passed away of a cocaine overdose I believe he was living in Vegas at the time and they found him dead in his apartment. Great band though. That was a really, like you hear that song and 
you cannot mistake his voice. That is a very, very, very unique voice, especially in a time when everybody was copying each other. To stand out was quite remarkable, so. Rest in peace, Kevin Dubrow. And Kevin is buried right here next to his stepfather. The music and memories live on. And so does Quiet Riot. They have a new singer and they still tour every year and they still go out and play those same songs in honor of Kevin. Take a look at all the wind chimes in here and take a listen too. Now we have at least one more grave that we want to find today. Maybe one, more than that, but at least one more that I want to see for sure. We're going to go see him now. Now we found our next person right here. This nondescript doesn't tell you anything about the man's history. And actually, in I, my opinion, it kind of says a lot about his humble nature. Mr. Robert C. Bob Wyan. If the name sounds familiar to you, then you're maybe one of the only ones that knows that name. This man is who is responsible for Bob's big boy. Bob took a $300 advance, started out making double-decker hamburgers, and next thing you know, with that chubby boy logo and the overalls, he had the Bob's Big Boy that would eventually, where I grew up, it became Frisch's Big Boy. He created that whole, that whole theme, everything. And it's one of the best places you can go, I feel like. I love, the one in Toluca Lake is the oldest one that still stands and the food there is awesome. If you've ever wanted to try it or thought about it, definitely try out Bob's Big Boy. Well, right inside here in an unmarked crypt here in the mausoleum is someone that you may not recognize the name of specifically, or maybe you will, but you might recognize what he's known for. This is the grave of Paul Crouch and his wife, who formed the Trinity Broadcasting Network. Very famous televangelist. You probably recognize their photo, but they're buried right up there. Now his parents were both uh, preachers, and he also went to um, Bible school and got a degree in theology, and then immediately started working in radio, um, trying to help build up some of the... Um, religious networks and was in the business for many many years and then eventually got the idea of starting his own the TBN uh, as soon as I uh, as soon as you see his face you probably recognize him from television or many of other various places but unfortunately it said that he fought a degenerative heart disease for 10 years before he passed away I'll post a picture of he and his wife right here. Well, I think Breck and I are gonna call it a day here at the cemetery, we're gonna head out of here. Well, man, you kinda met the Duke today, how was it? It was cool, yeah, it was, uh, I never knew he was out here, so it was kinda fun to see that. On our way out of here, I wanna show you they have a Memorial to victims of drunk driving. Dedicated to all of those who died needlessly at the hands of others who chose to drink and drive. Well, 
well now I think we can go I want to stop there and let you guys see that I think it's kind of powerful and definitely worth seeing well we're gonna stop and get a bite to eat and uh, since recently somebody has been complaining that I uh, I go to restaurants that are not easily available to everyone else we'll go to Jersey Mike's because I think there's one of these everywhere and we'll check this out yeah, yeah I've never actually eaten in here before so there we go that would be my first time too what are you thinking about, Breck? What are you getting? We were talking about the Philly cheese sticks the other day, and that sounds really good, so I think I might do that. Yeah, I probably will too. That's ours. They're making ours right now. So yeah, like I mentioned, I know I've mentioned this on the channel before, but the reason I show you guys places that I'm going to is because in case you come here, then you can try the place, or if you have any of the eateries that we go to in your area, which in a lot of cases some of you do. So yeah, I do understand that some people that watch this are not gonna be able to go to those places, but that's not what it's for. It's for if you are here to go to those places. All right, we got our food and we're taking it home so that we can hang out with Ja. All right, we got the Philly cheese steak. And uh, like I said, I've never actually been to a Jersey Mike's or ordered my own. I've been on movie sets where they ordered catering and it was like, the deli sandwiches that they make but this is really good I've had my first bite pretty good so far I like it Breck and I both got the same thing we just got the Jersey Mike's classic Philly cheesesteak with peppers and onions all that stuff on there so pretty much the same sandwich and look who's mooching what a mooch you think you're gonna get some of this huh says in 1956 Mike Subs opened its first neighborhood shop in the Jersey Shore he built it up basically until it was becoming a huge success and in 1975 a, uh, a young kid, 17 year old, and his football coach went in and bought it and built it up even more. There you go. It's always kind of weird to me to see these oil rig things out here in Orange County taking this guy for a walk. Well, unfortunately, I'm gonna have to say goodbye to John today because I'm, uh, I'm gonna be heading up to Paso Robles to do some vlogging for the next couple of days. Well, I've said goodbye to John and I'm headed home. Well, we're gonna go ahead and call it a night. We have an early day tomorrow. We're gonna take off and do a long drive. Head out to Paso Robles, so we'll see you all then. Have a great night and goodbye. <laughs>